Hey everybody and welcome along to HPC Tech Shorts for another episode. Uh, this week we're going to be talking to a couple of colleagues of mine who've been doing a bit of work in the, the Cryo EM space. Uh, and so let me just click some buttons here and I'm going to, there we go, I've got the guys in the room. Uh, I've got Brian Shervin who's one of our senior solution architects in London and I've got Steve uh, Lister in Boston, who's one of our principal biz devs uh, specializing in the healthcare and life sciences area. Um, and, and in fact, I've got the American guy living in the UK and the English guy living in America. So you guys swap countries, right? Yes. And I came from yours. Do, 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 do you like not stand each other? Is that what the problem yeah. was? Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, well, um, thanks for coming along. Um, Steve, you're, you're a recovering X-ray crystallographer. Uh, and so you've kind of got a pretty special look at what the whole cryo-EM field is doing because uh, it's kind of putting paid to your previous profession because it's a new technique that, that kind of, yeah. does it replace yeah. it? No, uh, makes it a whole lot better. Yeah, another tool, another tool in the toolbox. Yeah, uh, accelerate the science. Yeah. yeah. So how does it work? How's that paint paint that that picture for us? Sort of put it in context for us. Yeah. So you know, I've, I've been in crystallography for about thirty years now, thirty two years, and uh, so drug discovery about twenty eight years. Um, so I, I am really quite old uh, when it comes to the you know structure determination, and um, also high performance computing for about twenty years. And the reason all this comes together is because X ray crystallography at the time was was the large data generator of its time, producing tens of gigabytes of data that needs to be processed. So high performance computing was a natural progression of that. Now, some of the problems with crystallography is you have to grow a crystal. Some of these crystals can take six months to years to actually grow. What CryoEM has allowed us to do, even though CryoEM has been around since the 70s, so recent developments in detector technology, cooling mechanisms, and sample preparation, allows us to find the structure at near atomic resolution now using cryoelectron microscopy, which previously could have taken months, if not years, to do with X-ray crystallography. So this new technique really accelerates the discovery of a, of a protein structure, viral structure. Uh, and I think this was, you know, really came to the forefront last year with the, the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. And literally within a month or two, we had the structure of the COVID-19 spike protein, which then allowed us to accelerate um, virtual screening to, to look for molecules that maybe um, block the, the viral replication or treatment of the spike protein to, to stop it flip, prolif bleep, sorry, proliferating throughout the body. So cryo -EM yeah. as a technique is incredibly important in the scientific community and it's just growing from strength to strength. It is also a high performance computing problem in terms of the right. so data generating process. It, it sort of feels like from what you were saying the other day, without the HPC, it, 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 it almost wasn't a viable technique for the kind of use cases that it's got now. It's very difficult in terms of throughput because these groups were providing services. You know, the data could be anywhere from one to four terabyte, terabytes a day. As the detectors increase in um, sensitivity, they, you know, this could easily go up to eight terabytes, 10 terabytes. That's a lot of data to process and visualize and analyze um, within a set sure. period of time. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. So, um, now, Brian, you've got, you've actually got, some visuals for us to actually understand what's going on here. So yep. um, let me flip over. I think if I do that, yes, um, I'm gradually mastering this thing. Um, I'm going to hit the play button and let you talk us through this. There's like 30 yes, seconds so, or so with the video. Yep. So this is this is a workflow of what CryoSpark does. Um, and so you get these these samples coming off the micro off the electron microscope. It's called a micrograph, and you've got your sample suspended in ice, and that's what all those little blocks do. And we go through and we start to pick out what look like good candidates that we want to build a structure from. And so they come out and they look pretty blurry and you know poorly um, formatted there. But 
we can do some processing where we you know piece them together get a high risk structure and we repeat this process and and this is a you know very iterative process looking through terabytes and terabytes of data but once you do that you can start to do some refinements more math on it and get a high res structure that looks like this and you can start to see you know not only what the structure looks like and where you might bind drugs to or, or whatnot, but also, you know, how it moves and whatnot. So um, this is, this is the app, one of the applications that um, wow. uh, people use in this space and we've done some benchmarking on it. Wow. And, and actually okay. what, one of the distinctions there with, with crystallography as well is you, you can actually see that structure is the, you can actually capture motion in some of these. You can capture active states with cryoEM as well. So you, it's almost a combat, it allows you to see how the protein may move or react as well, which is another huge benefit when it right. comes so to Right, so you can actually, design. you can watch it interacting with its environment, I guess. In, in certain circumstances, yeah, you can capture active states and, and play that back and create wow. that, which wow. is incredibly important. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, okay. And, and yeah, I know, and this is why, this is why we have a vaccine. Um, this is why we have a bunch of vaccines right now and we're not still stumbling around trying to figure out how we're going to get out of COVID. Okay, so that, so far, so good. This is all, I'm learning a lot here. Um, okay, so now, Brian, the it, it, virtually all HPC, you know, you can, I mean, it, we don't want to be too reductive about it, but, but the com, you know, we can reduce it down to compute storage and networking as being the, the three big levers that we pull typically to make stuff go fast. Um, Talk, talk me through that because I think you've got, I know you've got some data because we've loaded it all up here on the, on the, uh, on the whiteboard. I'm going to be your, I'm going to be your whiteboard mover. Tell me where I need to go. So we're going to, we're going to go to this, uh, this graphic right, uh, right here. Um, so I'm going to just set the stage a little bit about CryoSpark. So this is this is the application from a company called Structure of Biotechnology. This is a startup in in Canada. They've been doing some awesome work, and they came to us and said, you know, we want to run this on AWS. What's the best way to do this? And and we got looking at at CryoSpark and how this works and. What you see here is it's a pipeline type application. So it's not just, you know, we're going to run one CFD solver and benchmark that. We've got a number of stages. Uh, the, the users are going to have to do some of this interactively, uh, but different stages are going to have different uh, compute requirements. And so we needed to, you know, do an analysis on each one of those stages to help build a better architecture on AWS. And actually, and so, that's kind of a virtual the cloud. You can actually, you can optimize the environment for each stage. So, okay, that makes sense so far. Good. Yep. So let, let's head it over to the right. Um, yeah. We'll just start with, uh, talk a little bit about the data set and, and what we did. So this particular data set that we worked on uh, was, it was relatively small in terms of uh, cryo EM data. It was about um, 3,000 images, uh, 500 uh, gigabytes in size. So relatively small, but it let us do a lot of different runs. And that's what you're looking at here. So we ran this ben this whole pipeline across a range of EC2 instance types. And you can, you can look in the graph there and see the types, but basically we're looking at three different GPU architectures. NVIDIA T4, NVIDIA A100 and the and the Tesla V100s and across different numbers of GPUs because some of these steps scale across GPUs. And lower uh, is better here, right? So yeah, lower is better. So we're looking at runtime in hours. So you want to, yeah, lower is better. Um, and so what actually gets really interesting is when we start to look at these stages individually. So let's head over to the next graph. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to do that. Here we go. Right. So this is this is one of those early stages that you saw in the in the animation. So what they're doing is they're they're doing some motion correction here. The the, the images that they take can kind of move actually when they're taking lots and lots of um, images off the microscope. So we've got to do a little motion correction. It's kind of like Photoshop on steroids. Mm -hmm. And and what we what we see here is this step scales really well, you know, up to eight GPU. So in this case, it's going to make sense to pick a large instance type like a P4D that has eight of these GPUs on it. Um, but if we go to another step, if you, if you want to head over to the next, next step, right. yep. you know, something like this, where we're, this is extraction. We're pulling out those templates that we've chosen. Uh, look, it doesn't make sense to run on, on eight GPUs because you're not going to gain any more performance. Um, oh. and it's going to, you're going to pay more. So let's run on a smaller, uh, you know, a smaller four GPU instance or, or, take one and split it, you know, run two jobs and make, make use of two GPUs per. So is this there, is, is the kind of like analysis. An into, is there an insight into why 
why why it just doesn't doesn't scale across multiple GPUs? Or is it? Yeah, so I've I've had some discussion with uh, with the CryoSpark developers at, at Structure, and they're you know they're a switched on crew. Um, they're they're looking at how they can better improve this, but it it basically comes down to, to some of the math that's involved behind behind doing this picking. Um, uh, but for now this kind of analysis was really, really important to them because they wanted to know what kind of instance types they should be picking um, and, and how big. Sure, don't, don't use more GPUs because you're not going to get any value out of them. It'll just cost you money. Right. Yeah. Okay. That makes total sense. So, so you mentioned, you know, all of, all of HPC is compute, networking, and storage. So we've kind of talked a little bit about the compute. Um, yeah. I want to move to storage a little bit. So what we're doing is, is a pretty important step in a, in a cryo-EM pipeline. This is 2D classification. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you can kind of see we can see some trends around scalability, uh, you know, in terms of going to four and eight GPUs, and and there's some you know discussions to be had here around which instance type. But one of the unique things uh, about this step, and this was a question that Structure had for us, was uh, on storage. So normally for this step, they recommend having some sort of really fast local storage on your on your instance on on your compute node. So that means you know fast SSD or an NVMe drive. And we have those that kind of uh, availability on some of our instance types, but not all of them. So, for example, the big massive P4D has eight terabytes of NVMe available, but a smaller single GPU doesn't. So, how do we match compute uh, and storage? You know, if if we're all, always having to pick, you know, the biggest one with the biggest NVMe drives. Um, and the answer was we we wanted to look at FSX for Luster. How right. that could so you, compare in performance. So you can then because completely decouple the, the instance choice from the local storage. It becomes yep. the storage is a thing, the instance is a thing, and you choose them separately. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Yep. So, so that, is that what this graph is? Yeah. So that's what we're looking at here. So this is um in this case, higher is better. We're looking at a percentage decrease in runtime uh using FSX for Luster versus that on on node local disk. Uh, and so you can see in some of these cases, you know, we're running 40, 50 percent faster with FSX for Luster than we are with with that local disk. Wow. OK, it's quite a surprise. Yeah. So that makes, OK, so that's interesting. And FSX for Luster for for anybody who doesn't remember, that's I mean, that's a that's a that's an that's an on demand Luster file system. You can spin up out of nowhere. You can hydrate it off an S3 bucket. So, so if you've got a whole metric ton of data um, sitting in an S3 bucket in object storage, you can hydrate it straight away out of, out of S3 into FSX and have that thing online pretty quickly so that it's just ready to, you know, available to your cluster or to your nodes straight away. Yep. Yeah, it means you have one, yep. one space where you can do all of your work. You can store your intermediate data. You can archive it back to S3, even yeah. into, you know, something like deep Glacier Deep Archive for, um, you know, for archival purposes. It makes it a lot simpler to manage your data rather than having to worry about moving it on and off of local node storage. Yeah. And you could, you could, you can elevate it. You're essentially with, with FSX for Luster, you really, your, your, your baseline storage is in S3 and you're elevating it to a higher performance plane in FSX for Luster. So you can, Beat beat the hell out of it with with your algorithms, and then put it straight straight back and turn off the the luster when you don't need it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I like to think of of S three. It's almost as a as a library, and you've got your immutable objects. They're your library books. And yeah. I'm going to check my library book out, process it. Now my results and the metadata put back into that immutable object store. Consistent metadata. I can go back twenty years. Here's a, my, here's how I got to this result from a reproducibility perspective. So really thinking that S3 is a library and that Lust yeah. is acting as a that library book layer. It's very that powerful. That makes sense so. because it, like a lot of people struggle with very large amounts of data, like petabytes and, yeah. and tens of petabytes of data. And in an on-prem universe, one of the only, they're, they're more or less, you know, when your only tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so they spend lot of their time trying to maintain and keep uptime on really big Luster file systems, Luster file systems that are, you know, 50 petabytes. Um, and we all know that Luster is not always the best way to manage stuff at the 50 petabyte scale. Um, you know, you, you, you know, S3 is much more durable, much more stable, much more reliable than any of those other file systems and POSIX level stuff. 
that's a that's actually a good way of managing data and you put it back into s3 where it's safe and sound you can archive it and put it into other tiers as you say right, that makes a whole yeah, and sense. especially for, for research data as well and this raw data that you may want to keep but you don't want to keep in a high performance file system chat yeah. that into an object based and, yeah. and again with this research data i know 80 80 percent of this raw data is basically write once read yeah. once maybe you never so, want to yeah. You may want to pull it out of archive five years from now just to check something. Uh, no, that makes sense. That actually makes sense. You don't want to stay online. So, yeah. sorry, Brian. I no, no, no. We got. So let let's move on. So to kind of put this in in a in, in context, we you know we looked at at, at compute and storage, um, but we also want to figure out what this costs because it, it'd be easy to just say run this on you know a big P four D instance end to end, get it done as fast as possible, but yeah. you know maybe that may not be what everyone wants to do. So we did things like look at, you know, total simulation cost and we can, you know, we can see some trends here. And what was really interesting was that these G4 instances are, wow. are quite interesting. There's, you know, they're a third, the price roughly. Um, wow. Obviously they aren't at the same performance as the P4s, but because we have this pipeline approach and because we can, you know, spin up uh, uh, an HPC cluster with parallel cluster in about 15 minutes and create compute queues with all of these different instance types, you can now, you know, submit a job that runs on low cost G4s when you need it or runs it on a P4 on demand uh, when you need that performance for some of those steps. So we, we ran into this the other week when we were talking with uh, Neil Ashton about CFD. And it was a it was an interesting trade off to be made, which was that you know he was comparing C six GN, which is the graviton slash arm, you know based instance, uh, against some Intel instances. And what he was generally finding, if you if you absolutely had a time pressure and you needed the answer right now, you use use the Intel instances. If you had a price performance goal that you were trying to achieve, you use the graviton ones. And and so it was really just a matter of you know dialing in what optimization you were looking for and take your pick. Um, yep. That seems very much the case here. Yep. And so, if you if you go over to the next graph, I'm going to show you what we what we started to do next with some of this benchmark data. So this is just a, a a visual breakdown of each of these steps in a pipeline. And this one's on the G4 DN metal, but they all roughly follow this uh, kind of the same trend where you can now start to see where some of these stages scale well. And so I can look at this and go, you know, for those blue and those those orange stages, which are the some of the, the patch correction, patch motion, et cetera. Those are the ones I want to focus on scalable instances. And some of these others, like the red and the green, don't scale that well throughout the course of the, the simulation. So let's pick single node GPUs. And so what I've done is, and I, we don't have this data here, but it's going to be in a, a benchmark data that we publish soon. Uh, I've gone through and done some analysis on this and, and looked at kind of mixing and matching instance types where a pipeline will have like right. two different types of G4s, a P4, and I can get the cost actually pretty much in line with, with what you see on the previous graph, but it, it runs even faster. And so with this wow. kind of data, we can really, you know, help, help structure of recommend what are some good, in, what are some good instance types to choose for their cryo EM pipelines. This, this just keeps underscoring the fact that, you know, if you were if you're in a fixed environment on prem, you'd have no choice but to just you know you've got one kind of GPU and one kind of node, probably, yeah. right? And and everything will just go as just as fast as however many of those things you can throw at it. Um, this is different because you're optimizing each portion of the pipeline to run just as fast as it needs to run, uh, and and you could actually even pick apart each one on a price performance metric, price performance versus straight line performance. That's that's pretty neat. That is really neat. Yeah. And, and and having that flexibility, especially with lab instrumentation, like you know, these new detectors come through, all of a sudden you may have 10 times the amount of data as you had previously. And you want to be able to grow that infrastructure in parallel with that instrumentation. You know, we saw the same in sequencing, we've seen the same in imaging and now in cryo-electron microscopy. So keeping up with the technology or IT to keep up with technology is a really difficult situation yeah. so this gives you that flexibility and freedom to, to grow with the instrumentation as well which i think is really powerful and given that this is a pipeline i mean you you ran all of this with with what you ran this on parallel cluster with slurm is that right yep and would you i mean would you you could reasonably then have 
parallel cluster set up with multiple slurm queues, different slurm partitions, one for each kind of instance type or one, you know, optimized for different, you know, for different, different, uh, I don't know, procurement patterns. You may, may use spot for some, although I wouldn't use spot for, for this, but you could use spot for some or, or on demand for some, you could have some reservations for others. Is there, is there any reason why you couldn't, like, is this a containerizable workload at some point? Uh, potentially it, that's something that we're, that we're talking with, uh, structure about. Um, I will say there, there are other cryo -EM packages that, that are containerized right now. Uh, mm. and so you could, you, that is certainly an option for those. Cause the, you know, definitely like in the genomic space, we see an awful lot of folks using pipeline tools like Nextflow to construct pipelines. And then they, they focus on optimizing their pipelines, not trying to optimize clusters. Right. And Nextflow's got really great integration with Batch. Anyway, this is interesting. The good thing is here, you know, horses for courses, you can do it either way. Okay, that's that's really neat. Um, all right. Well, so is there any last things that we want to that we want to um, uh, that we want to look at? I think we've exhausted all of your graphs, right? Yep, that's it. Wow. All right. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. So we continue, and, and you know. We, Brian and the, and the group were continuing to develop this and look at different architectures and as new technologies come through, new applications come through and integrate those within the pipeline as well. It's, it's really important. Yeah. And this is really cool. Well, well, you know, I mean, anyway, this has been eye opening for me. I've learned a whole bunch. Uh, 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 I'm a recovering scientist as well. So um, I feel your, I feel the joy and some of the pain. Um, how are people going to find out more about this? I think I just I got this here. We've got a we've got a deployment guide you've been working on with Structura, uh, Structura Biotechnology, who's the the actual partner who builds this product, right? Yes. Yeah. So we we've been working with them around uh, the deployment guide, a reference architecture. It's basically all built on parallel cluster. So we tried to design it to be easy to deploy. We're, we're doing the final revisions with them this week and this should be published uh, on their website uh very soon uh and we'll also have some some media around uh from from aws uh like a blog post covering the same material um cool. so watch this space okay well um for everybody watching at home we'll actually update the show notes when that you know when that uh, deployment guide and the blog post land uh we'll keep those we'll keep the show notes on this episode up to date um, we'll certainly put some of the any of the links that we've got here. We'll put in show notes straight away today, and and you know we'll keep you up to date as we go along. All of that, by the way, is a good reason why uh, I have to give my plug here. You know, if you like the content you're seeing in this series, please subscribe, uh, share it with with your friends and your colleagues so that they know about the content as well. We've got a whole ton of stuff coming up on parallel cluster, on batch, uh, DCV. Uh, you know, and, and some engine frame stuff as well. We've got a got a few great talks on on elastic fabric adapter coming up in the next uh, uh, in the next few weeks, where we're going to talk about EFA and SRD uh, and and exactly how far they've penetrated into the into the AWS network fabric and and, and other services. So, um, if you like what you see, please please click like. It does help us out a lot, so that we can keep the right content coming. Subscribe and share with your friends. Um, Steve, Brian, thank you for coming along today. This was actually super cool. I learned a lot. Um, and hopefully everybody else has too. Yeah, that's really yeah, thank you. great. Cool. Really exciting space. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks. Thanks.